Good morning. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord this morning? It is. Amen. If you would, turn with me to 667. <clears throat> the blue book. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, spread the tidings all around, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, bear the news to every land, across the waves, onward is our Lord's command, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, walk it on the rolling tide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, tell to sinners far and wide. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing ye. Jesus saves. Save the last verse. Give the winds a mighty one. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Shout and sing. Full and free. Highest hills and deepest It's our song. The victory Jesus saves Jesus saves well look what the Lord has done 
Look what, what the, the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just, just in time. time. I'm going to praise his name. He's just the same. I'm gonna praise him. I'm gonna praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He healed my body. He touched my mind He, he saved me Just in time, time. Oh, I'm, I'm gonna praise his name I've got to praise his name He's evermore the same I'm gonna praise him I'm gonna praise him Look what the Lord has done I'm gonna praise him I'm gonna praise him. Look what the Lord has done. Amen. Hallelujah. Let's give him a hand this morning. Amen. Yeah. Look what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. Father, we worship you this morning. And Lord, all these people standing here in the presence is just evidence of what God has done. Because Lord, if you hadn't moved in our life, we wouldn't be here today. Lord, if, we, if, if you hadn't saved us, we wouldn't be singing your praise or rejoicing and, and just blessing you. So, Lord, we can look around and see what God's done. We can see lives that have been transformed. Lord, we can see miracles that have taken place. So, Father, we will rejoice in the knowledge that you are still at work in this world. You're still doing what no one else can do. And we can still proclaim that Jesus saves because the blood of Jesus has never lost its power. So Lord, we're so thankful for amazing grace today. Lord, we ask you to be glorified in this place. We pray that everything that's said and done will bring glory and honor to the name of Jesus. And Father, we pray that every person would find what they need here today in your presence. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Good morning. Thank you for choosing to come and be with us today. Let me give you a few quick announcements. There's a whole lot of them, and I'll never remember them, I'm sure. But 6 o'clock this evening, we're setting, continuing to set up for uh, Hallelujah, which will be Tuesday evening from 6 to 9. Janie, Terrell, you guys want to say anything about that? Cakes for the cakewalk. Helpers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Amen. Absolutely. Well, I'm short. Jesus is coming, and everybody needs to know that there is hope. And that's what Hallelujah is all about. Hope in a hopeless world, light in the darkness. And it's an opportunity to be a witness. It's an opportunity to have the mission field come to us. So I urge you, be a part of it. All righty. I know that uh, Wednesday night will be clean up from hallelujah so come between six and seven and we'll see if we can get things squared away also before you know it it's going to be time for the hanging of the green so uh, i know that Teresa's running some of those announcements up here but if you want to sing or do something like that in the hanging let joy know asap and uh, if you can be a part of any of it see her or Kim uh, 
we still need things for our Operation Christmas Child for the shoebox ministry. So please continue to bring uh, things that are needed for that. If you have questions about it, see uh, Cricket. And what have I missed? I'm sure there's something. Oh, yeah. Next, next Saturday you gain, or next Sunday morning, you gain an hour of sleep. Mm-hmm. Which is good, but then it gets dark at 2 o'clock, so, you know. <laughs> anyway, you know, I, I thought they were going to legislate this to one time, but it's not been successful yet. So uh, we still fall back and spring forward and do all those strange things. You know, cut off one end of something and tie it to the other to think it makes it longer. Brilliant. Okay, what else? Any other announcements? All right, I guess that's it. Could we have a couple of folks to receive the offering this morning? Okay, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to return to you a portion of what you've given to us. Lord, we do it in obedience to your word. We do it to acknowledge that everything that we have comes from your hand. And we do it to acknowledge our faith in the promise that says, My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. So we ask you to bless and multiply this today in Jesus' name. Amen. touched me oh he touched me and oh the joy that floods my soul something happened and now I know he touched me and made me whole. Praise God for his touch. Amen. Amen. You know, when we uh, spend time watching what's happening in the world around us and looking at the news and, and see all the depressing events, it's easy to allow our view of what's happening and the disasters and the terrible things taking place, it's easy to let that begin to diminish our view of who we serve and who stands with us. We start to see the problems and we start to see the situations larger than the God that we serve. And that's a bad place to be. And what I want to do before we, before we worship for a minute this morning, I want to read this to you. You know, uh, I can imagine just a little bit of how John must have felt when they exiled him to Patmos. Now think about it. He, the only thing he'd done wrong was preach the gospel. And so they try different things to shut him up, and finally they decide the only thing they can do is get rid of him. So they banish him to this penal colony on this little island in the Mediterranean. And you wonder how he's feeling. And he's out there and he's away from about everybody. Maybe there's some other prisoners out there. And it had to be kind of a depressing thing. But if you remember that first chapter of Revelation where Jesus appears to him. And I want to read this to you this morning because this is a reminder of how big our God is. And as the word says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Listen to this. He said he, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day and he heard a, heard a voice. He heard this sound behind him. 
And he turned to see the voice that spoke with him. And he said, being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, white as snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. His voice is the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. His countenance, in other words, his face, was as the sun shines in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I'm the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. So that's what he says to us today. Fear not, because I'm the one that has the keys. And you know, that old saying, the one who has the keys is the one who's in authority. That's who we serve this morning. Stand up and let's praise the God that we serve. Sing it like you mean it today. When he rolls up his sleeve, he ain't just putting on the red. Our God is an awesome God. There's thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fist. Our God is an awesome God. When he kicked him out of Eden, it wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very soon, you better be believing. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Yes, he is. Yeah. The sky was starless in the void of the night. Our God is an awesome God. He spoke into the darkness and he created light. Our God is an awesome God. Judgment and wrath he poured out on Sodom. Mercy and grace he gave us at the cross. I hope that we have not too quickly forgotten. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. God, He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Sing again. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven God. Our God is an awesome God. My God is so big. He 
so strong and so mighty there is nothing my God cannot do my God is so big and so strong and so mighty there's nothing my God cannot do my God is so big and so strong and so So big and so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. In the beginning, God made everything. God simply spoke and the world came to be. Then He sent a flood and made everything new. He parted the sea and let its people walk through. He helped a boy bring a giant right down. Joshua marched the walls fell to the ground. These acts of power are worthy of praise. But if you want to question my God and I'll look you in the eye and say, My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. Though we are sinners, He still gave us work. God sent His Son to live here on the earth. The sick and he made blind men see. He let the lame walk and he set the world free. Died on a cross and he rose from the grave. He conquered sin, he is mighty to save. He went to heaven and he's coming back. God's word is true, but if it's a time, I'll look you in the eye and say, My, my God is so big. And so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. God, the Spirit, God, the Father, God, the Son, one plus one plus one equals one. God, the Spirit, God, the Father, God, the Son, one plus one plus one equals one. I want the world to know about my God. I want to live so the whole world will see that my heart is changed. I'm forgiven and new. If people need proof, may they see it in me. Let's look the world in the eye. Let's look them in the eye and say, My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big and so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. Amen. Hallelujah. There's nothing our God can't do. It doesn't matter how big. It doesn't matter how small. It doesn't matter how many or how few. There's nothing our God cannot do. Because our God is so great and so awesome, He alone deserves all the praise and the glory. Amen. So let's bless Him today. Our God, 
Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing it again. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Yes, Lord. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Let's lift it a little higher. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship in one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our We give you glory and honor today because you are worthy. You are worthy. You're worthy. Lord, we worship you. God, I pray that today you'd give us such a vision of the glory of God, Lord, that it would cause everything else just to pale into insignificance. Lord, the, the affairs that are going on in this world are 
are, are, are soul shaking. But Lord, help us to realize the magnitude and the majesty of the God that we serve. God, give us, give us a fresh revelation of the glory of the God that we serve, the power of the God that we serve. Lord, help us, help us not to be intimidated by what we see, but in awe of the one that we serve. God, we worship you today. We worship you. And Lord, we're so thankful for the love of God that transcends knowledge. Lord, the grace and the mercy of the God that loved us enough to lay down his life for the, for the vilest of us, Lord God, the most hopeless and the most helpless. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice You have led me through the fire darkest night you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, running after me this is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. So, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after, running after me Your goodness is running after Running after me with my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, 
running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. Your goodness is running after, running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, running after me. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. All my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God Father let us always sing of the goodness of God Lord regardless of what's happening in our lives and what's taking place about us Lord let us sing of your goodness because the word tells us that surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Lord, your goodness surely is following and chasing after us. And we will dwell in your house forever. Help us to always sing of your goodness. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. You can only set so long. Hello, Sam. Have I got something in this? Yeah, there it is. Okay. Good enough. Let me share this card with you. It says, thank you so much for the thoughtful gift and most of all for your prayers. We greatly appreciate them. God bless you all. Love and prayers. The uh, matinee family. Is that right or wrong? Is that right? Matinee. Okay. All right. Well, let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 10 and begin in verse 35. God's word says, cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. You know, we have a tendency to lose confidence if things don't go our way. And if an answer doesn't come quickly, we tend to lose confidence in our prayers and God's promises and his faithfulness. But the word says, don't cast away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward for you have need of patience. <laughs> We're all blessed with patience, right? <clears throat> Not an impatient person in the crowd today. That's wonderful. You have need of patience. After you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Boy, I like that. Listen to that again. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we're not of those who draw back to perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Say, I ain't drawing back. That's right. 
We're going to hang in there, amen? amen? The Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes that there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. And it says in the third chapter that there's a time to love and a time to hate and a time of war and a time of peace. In the life of a nation or in the life of individuals, there's times when it's relatively peaceful. And then there's times that are hard times. We we'll go through those in our life, don't we? We remember times in our life that things were going pretty good. Most of us don't realize how, how, how good it is from the time we're, say, six till we're about 18. Most of the time, that's pretty good because somebody else is feeding you and paying your bills and keeping a roof over your head. And uh, all you have to do is put up with things like school, you know. But that's a pretty good time if, you know, if you had a good family and so on and so forth. And then you get out on your own and you realize what uh, expenses are involved in living. <laughs> And it gets a little more difficult. And then you go through those different times of hardship. You may face sickness. You may face accidents. You may face times when things don't go right. And then, and you know, that's true in the life of a nation and the life of an individual. And folks, honestly, for a lot of years, we've been going through a pretty peaceful time in this nation. We've had things. We've had bumps in the road. But we're entering a time that's pretty tough. And it's got the potential of being really tough. So what I want to talk to you about today is keeping your confidence. Keeping your confidence. You know, Jesus warned that things would happen in both in our life and in the world. And he warned us about the things we're seeing right now. And he's, he said this in John 14. He said, I've told you these things before. They come to pass so that when they come to pass, you'd believe. And that's what we've got to do is we watch what's unfolding in the world around us. What we have to do is realize that it's confirming our faith. It's proving the validity of Scripture. It's telling us that what we've read in the Word of God, what we've heard preached and taught is real. And we can base our life on it, our eternity on it. And everything we see confirms the hour that you're living in. You know, you've all heard all your life, you've heard the expression, the last days. Well, what you see happening right now is what Jesus foretold. And we realize we are in the last days. And folks, let me tell you, we're not just in the last days, but we're in the last of the last days. Because the things that are happening now, Jesus said they would happen in the latter part. So that's, that's where we are. And, and as we watch this stuff, it's, you know, it, it should increase our faith. But what I want to talk about for a minute is the war that's going on between Israel and Hamas, Hezbollah, and these other proxies of Iran. As you look at it, we realize, and we realize it more every day, that it's got the potential of turning into something much more than what it is right now has the potential of a lot of nations becoming involved. Us, Iran, China, Russia, and on and on. So there's a lot of potential for a lot of mess soon to happen, I really believe. But here's what we've got to understand, and this is the mindset we've got to have looking at what's happening and going into this. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Most of us can quote this from memory. It says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. King James says in high places, it literally means the heavenlies or in the spirit realm. So the war that we're seeing taking place right now is in all actuality. It's a war that's happening between spiritual beings that are influencing the humans that are playing it out. And, it, and if we stop and look at it for just a minute from a logical standpoint, it becomes even more clear because think about this. No normal human being would take pleasure in decapitating babies. 
No normal human being would take pleasure in burning people alive and all the atrocities that we see going on. It takes a demonic power to do that. So that's what we're seeing happening right now. The things that we're seeing is the physical manifestation of a war that's been going on in one form or another ever since Lucifer rebelled against God. And I know this is, this is a kind of going over stuff that most of us know, but bear with me this morning. Uh, Isaiah 14, beginning in verse 12, the Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down from to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will set also on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like the most high, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. From the very moment that Lucifer, or as we call him now, Satan, from that moment that he was cast out of that place that he had had before, he's been working to preempt what God wants to do. He's been working to try to stop any move that God is about to make. Because you see, he's a spiritual being and he can see in the spirit realm. He can see what's happening in, in, the, in the place where angels and, and, and God and the, the demonic function on a, on a different dimension that you and I walk in. So you can see what's going on. So when he sees that God is about to do something, he immediately begins to work to either cause it not to happen or to hinder it. So let's think for a few minutes. So let's look at history. In the beginning, of course, God created the human race, and he did it with the purpose of the human race being his family. They were going to be with him through eternity. They were going to help him rule his creation. So what did he do? The devil, the preemptor, the one that uh, wants to, you know, get back at God because God gave him the, the, the boot, so to speak, he moves to stop this plan that God has. You know, God was creating a family, so to speak. So what does he do? He enters the Garden of Eden. He entices Eve and Adam to sin. And the result of that was the near extinction of the human race with the exception of eight people. So that was quite a move. He almost, almost was able to wipe out at what God had created. Eight people survived. Then let's jump ahead a little bit. Let's go, to, let's move up to Abraham. And God, of course, chose Abraham to be the progenitor of the race and the nation that would be the channel through which Messiah was going to come. So what happens? If you remember your Old Testament, you know that God spoke to Abraham and he made a covenant with Abraham. And he said that he was going to make a mighty nation of him, that in him and through him all the families of the earth would be blessed and on and on and on. And, of course, he made that statement, which is still true today, I will bless those that bless you and I will curse those that curse you. And history has proven that to be exactly correct. Those that have blessed the Jews have prospered. Those that have cursed them have, well, had a bad day. Anyway, so what happens? God tells Abraham and Sarah that they're going to be the fathers and mothers of a multitude of people. Time goes by, and if you remember what happens, they're waiting on this promise, and the devil puts in the heart of Sarah to come up with a plan. Now, the Bible does not say that the devil put this in Sarah's heart, but it was not God's plan, so it only had to come from somewhere else. So what happens? Sarah's barren. She's getting old. Abraham's, you know, they're both old. And she says, I've got this Egyptian handmaiden named Hagar. You take her as a wife, and you can have this promised child through her. Well, of course, he did. And Ishmael is born. But God speaks to Abraham, and he says, no, Sarah is going to have a son. <laughs> 90 years old, 100 years old, lo and behold, Isaac comes forth 14 years after Ishmael. And what happened? War ever since. War ever since. So Satan was moving then to try to, <laughs> to, try to preempt the plan of God. Let's jump ahead a little bit further. 
Let's go ahead unto the time of Moses. All right, now Abraham's descendants, of course, have been down in Egypt, and they have become slaves, and they're building the treasure cities of the pharaohs, and their cry comes up to heaven, and God says, it's time to bring my people out of Egypt. What happens? The moment that the devil gets wind of this, he moves Pharaoh to do what? To have every male baby of the Israelites killed, thrown into the Nile for crocodile food. But, of course, God spares, supernaturally spares Moses. We move ahead a little bit further. Let's go ahead to the time of Jesus. When God is about to send his Messiah, when he's about to send his son into this world, and Jesus is born in Bethlehem, what happens? Satan moves the heart of Herod to have every baby two years old and under in Bethlehem and the surrounding area put to death. Every time that God is moving or about to move, the devil jumps on it trying to preempt it or trying to stop it. Let's go a little bit further. So let's come ahead to more modern time. When God is about to rebirth the nation of Israel, what happens? The devil already moves and he puts in the heart of Adolf Hitler and others to wipe the Jews from the face of the earth. Six million are exterminated in the Holocaust. But 1948, Israel was reborn. So that brings us up to the present time. What do we see happening right now? We see this tremendous rise in anti-Semitism. All you have to do is look, get online or look at the news. All over the world, there's riots. All over the world, there's killed Jews. All over the world, there's this tremendous hatred that's boiling up for the Jewish people. And, of course, we've got the war now that's broken out over there. And all the, you know, the nations around Israel want to destroy, want to destroy that nation. Why is that? Here's the reason. Because God's about to do something. Jesus is about to return. Every time that God is about to move, Satan tries to preempt it. Every time God's about to do something supernatural and awesome and world-changing, the devil tries to stop it or hinder it. That's why you see what's happening right now. All this stuff has come to the front and boiling point again because the devil sees Jesus is about to come back. The devil sees that Jesus is about to come back and establish his kingdom on this earth. That's why we're seeing this desire to annihilate the Jewish race and to wipe out the city of Jerusalem and wipe Israel from the map. But I can tell you this, it ain't worked before and it ain't going to work now. It's not going to work now. We're about to see two things happen. I can't tell you the order, but I can tell you what they are. Jesus is returning for his church and we're about to see God do a supernatural intervention in, a, in, the, in the war that's ta- beginning to take place and will intensify. You can read Ezekiel 38 and 39. We've talked about it many times. I'm not going to go through it. But it talks about this massive army that's coming in. It talks about the confederacy of nations that are going to be joined together. We're seeing them that alliance form right now. But God says that he's about to have his anger come up in his face. And this is what he says he's going to do, Ezekiel 38, 23. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I'm the Lord. When God moves on behalf of Israel, and it's an impossible thing, with this massive army coming against this one little piece of land the size of the state of New Jersey, and all of a sudden, the heavens open up and hail and fire and all this stuff comes down and earthquakes on and on and on. The nations will know it wasn't Israel. It was somebody else. And it's not us and it's not any Great Britain or anybody else. It's Almighty God. God's going to show off. And he's going to show that he is the one that defends Israel. So those are the things where we, I, you know, part of me says, I hope I'm here to see that. But it would be real good to watch it from heaven. <laughs> you know? 
there wouldn't be nearly the aches and pains. But anyhow, I don't know how long it's going to be between this move of the devil where he's trying to destroy and God moving. I can't tell you that, but I can tell you this. It's not going to be long. It's not going to be long. Jesus could return at any minute for his people. Uh, but if, if he tarries, he's already told us what these days that you and I are entering into right now are going to be like. This is in the book of Luke chapter 21, and I'm going to, I'm going to read this to you. And I understand as I read this to you, he was speaking to the Jews. He was speaking to his disciples who were Jewish. You know, this is when, when they're sitting out on the Mount of Olives looking back at, at Mount Moriah, looking back at the Temple Mount. And, you know, he's already told them the temple's going to be destroyed. And he's, they've asked him about the signs of his coming and what it was going to be like in the days leading up to his return. And I'm going to begin reading Luke 21 and verse 9, Jesus is speaking. And he said, when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. And that's what he's saying to every one of us today. Don't be terrified. Don't be, don't be terrified by it. For these things must first come to pass. So it's going to happen because he said it had to. So we might as well not panic. <laughs> know that it's coming. Know that he already knows that. Know that he's already told you that so you wouldn't panic. But he's told you that to get ready and get close to him. That's where, that's, you see, that's where safety is in the presence of God. The end is not by and by. And then he said to them, nations shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be earthquakes in diverse places, famines, pestilence, fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these things, they shall lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues, to prisons, and being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Now understand, that's happened to the Jews. That happened a short time after he said these words. But it's still going on. It's still going on. And when I say he said this to the Jews, no, well, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 11 says this, the things that happened to them were for examples to you and I upon whom the ends of the world are come. 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. So, this is not just for him, them, it's for you and I as well, okay? He was saying, this is what's going to happen. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. You and I are going to be in a, in a position to witness and, and to tell people what's going on, why it's going on, and how we have hope through this time. And I, and I love what he says. He says, settle it therefore in your hearts, not to meditate before what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to gainsay or resist. God says, when I give you the opportunity to share with somebody, don't be afraid you can't because I'll give you what you need. You see, that's, the, that's one of the functions of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not only a comforter, but he's also our teacher. He's also a memory aid. He's the one that helps us remember what Jesus said. He's the one that can bring Scripture to your mind when you need to share something with somebody. I've heard people say, well, I'm afraid to witness. I don't know what to say. Right here's proof that you ain't got a leg to stand on because he said, I'll tell you if you'll just open your mouth. Think about it. All right, don't panic. Don't worry about it. I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to gain, serve, or resist. And then he said, oh, by the way, you will be betrayed both by parents and brethren, kinfolk and friends, and some of you they'll cause to be put to death. In other words, what he's saying is this. <laughs> some who you think will stand with you won't. But don't be discouraged because he said, I'm with you. I'm with you always, even to the end of the world or end of the age. God does not want us living in fear. He said, you're going to be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not a hair of your head perish. He must have mine stored somewhere. In your patience possess you your souls. When he says there's not a hair of your head going to perish, it literally means to be utterly lost or utterly destroyed. Why do you say that? Because if 
this old body is destroyed. He's got a good one with more hair waiting on us. You're not going to lose anything. Listen, if, if we die, if we die, and here's why he doesn't want us to be afraid. If you as a child of God die, you're going to be immediately in the presence of God. In eternal life, in fullness of joy, and the only thing that you're going to lose is suffering, and you'll gain everything. That's why he wants us not to be afraid. And he says, in your patience, you possess or you preserve your soul. That word patience means endurance. Over in the book of 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you're partakers of Christ's suffering. That when his glory will be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. Listen to this verse. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now think about this. He's saying when you're persecuted for the name of Jesus, when you're going through hardships because of your stand for him, something's going to come upon you, the spirit of glory and of God, which tells you if you have to go through hard times, he's going to give you the power and the anointing to do it. He's not going to throw you out there and say, yeah, you got to make it on your own. Just stand tough. Listen to it again. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. I used to wonder, man, those old martyrs that suffered for Jesus must have been something else. How could they stand firm when they were about to be killed? How could they stand firm when they were about to be tortured? And the truth is this. God gives you what you need for the situation that you're in. He puts the strength on you. He puts the power of the Holy Ghost on you when you're having to face that. It's not like you're such a super Christian and so full of faith that you can say, yeah, whack off my arm, it's no big deal. It's the power and the presence and the Spirit of God that comes upon you when you're facing that situation. God gives us what we need. I used to worry, Lord, I'll never be able to stand up under torture trying to stay, stay faithful to Jesus. No, I can't, but He can and the power that he puts upon you, that spirit of glory and of God that comes on you when you're in that situation will carry you through. Let's go a little bit further. Let's go back over to Hebrews 10 again. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Hmm. God's telling us when we go through these tough times, when we look at what's happening in the world, don't lose confidence in God's word. Don't lose confidence in his promise. And don't lose confidence in your salvation. The devil will whisper in your ear, if this was true, you wouldn't be going through what you are. If the promises were true, God would get you out of this mess. If you were really saved, it wouldn't be happening to you. Listen to me. We've got to have confidence in our salvation. You know, you go back to Ephesians, you read about the weapons of our warfare, you read about our armor, and one really important thing is the helmet of salvation. Well, what's that all about? Well, a helmet protected your head. It protected your mind. And if you are confident in your salvation, it's protecting your mind from those lies that Satan's trying to put in there. When he's trying to cause you to doubt the promise of God, doubt the word of God, doubt your salvation, and cause your faith to shake, if you're confident in your salvation, it's like having that helmet on that protects you from the lie of the enemy. If you're confident in your salvation, you can walk through hard times knowing that regardless of what happens, you have a future, you have an inheritance, you've got a, a, a savior and a deliverer, and you're going to spend eternity in fullness of joy in his presence. Be confident in your salvation. And if you're not confident in your salvation, don't wait a moment 
to get right with God and be confident that you are saved and your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. Cast not away your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. For you have need of patience. After you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. All of us need patience. You know, I want God to move right now or yesterday, but God moves in his time. And his time's always right because he sees the end from the beginning. If you look that word that's translated patient, up in the Greek, it comes from a word that means to be steadfast and to endure. And the root word means to remain. Remain. I remember when Jesus was, was teaching and he taught something that just had everybody floored. And the Bible says a lot of the disciples turned away and didn't walk with him anymore. And he looked at Peter and he said, are you going to leave too? And Peter said, where would we go? You're the one that has the words of eternal life. And, you know, when we go through those times that uh, things just almost overwhelm us and, and the devil's, you know, been really working and he's causing our faith to shake a little bit and maybe there's something just throw up our hands and quit. Remember what life was like before you came to Jesus. And you'll remember why you're here. Folks, I remember what mine was like. There ain't nothing there that I'd want to go back to. If I look back at the misery I used to be in, it's easy to know why I'm here with him today. There is nowhere else to go. That's why you're here. Believe me, I tried everything I could think of. And this is the only thing that works. This is the only thing that gives peace. This is the only thing that gives fulfillment. It's the only thing that gives purpose. It's the only thing that makes sense. Walk with Jesus. Be steadfast. Remain. If we will be patient, if we'll endure, if we'll remain with him, we're going to receive the promise. Listen to this. You have need of patience. After that you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. What's the promise? <laughs> a little, yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. The promise is, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. That's the promise. That's the blessed hope. That's what you and I are looking for every day. We better be. The Bible says he's going to appear to those that love his appearing. That's who he's coming back for. And man, I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. And the way the devil is moving right now tells me that it's about to happen. Because he's the, he's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants to preempt God's move. And he does all he can. But he can't. He can't. The way he's working right now says that God's move is coming soon. So that's the promise. Yet a little while and he that shall come will come and he will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. If any man draw back, my soul will have no pleasure in him, but we're not of them that draw back to perdition or utter destruction, but of them which believe to the saving of the soul. Now, the days have come when we have to live by faith. We have to walk by faith. We have to look at things through the lens of faith. We have to come to the point where we realize that we serve a God that's so awesome that he can call those things that are not as though they were. And he can bring things into existence out of nothing. And he's the God that will supply our needs. So these are the days that we, as his people, must live by faith. And it's time to build that faith, to build it by spending more time in the word more time in his presence, more time in fellowship with other believers, more time praying for and encouraging one another by looking at the events that are going around us in the world in the light of prophecy. That will build our faith as well. So everything you see tells us Jesus is coming, and he's coming soon. So we should be rejoicing. We should be celebrating. We should be praising God with everything that's within us. And if we are people that are doing that, the world will absolutely be convinced we're crazy. 
when everything that's going on in this world and you're rejoicing and you're praising the Lord and you got to understand something, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll think you're off the deep end. And a lot of times they want to know, you know, what pushed you over the edge and you can tell them, I'm not rejoicing because there's a war going on. I'm not rejoicing because people are suffering. I'm rejoicing because it tells me my savior is coming to this world. And this is my hope, and this is the reason I can have hope and faith and joy and peace in the midst of what's happening right now is because I know in whom I've believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. So we need to be a people of rejoicing. We need to be a people of witness. We need to be telling people about Jesus. We need to be sharing hope in these last days, and we need to remember what verse 37 says. Yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. He's coming. Don't lose your confidence. Don't lose your confidence. Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful for your word because it tells us what we need to know. It tells us how we need to live. It tells us what's happening, why it's happening, and what you're doing about it, what's about to take place. It tells us that soon and very soon we're going to see the king. It tells us that the day will soon come when you'll step out on the clouds of heaven. The trumpet will sound. You'll say, come up here and we'll be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. And so will it ever be with the Lord. It'd be a tremendous family reunion with people that have gone on before us. Lord, we know that the, uh, the day is soon to come when you'll return with us to rule and to reign on this earth. And Satan will be cast into the bottomless pit and shut up for a thousand years. We know that that's soon to happen. So that's why we rejoice. That's why we celebrate. That's why we can be joyful today in the midst of everything that's going on in this world. And Father, I pray for every person here in this room and every person that might listen to this message. Lord, if there's anybody that's not confident of their salvation, let this be the moment that they make it right with you that they say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I know that Jesus is the Son of God who came, lived, died on a cross, not for his sin, but for the sin of the world, was buried and rose again on the third day and ascended back into heaven. And I ask Jesus Christ to be my Savior, forgive my sin, I commit my life to him. And Lord, I know if they'll ask, they'll receive. And Father, I pray for encouragement for your people. Lord, I pray for an anointing upon us that we would be able to, to witness and to share the, the good news of the gospel in these last days. And Lord, that we would live in a constant expectation of that soon return of Jesus, knowing that that will happen. But until it does, we're going to show the world that we're not afraid, that we have a Savior, that we have a blessed hope, and we want to tell them about it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. A couple of things we want to do before we dismiss. Jeff, you wanted to do something here. If you'll bear with us just for about five minutes, I promise we won't, well, maybe six. Maybe six minutes. You know why Jeff said he might extend it to six? Because he calls me Chatty Kathy. <laughs> um, this weekend, Jeff and I were discussing some uh, precious keepsakes that his mother had left with us. And, and among them, among many things, were some antique looking handkerchiefs. Uh, I'll show you like one. That's called tatting, and grandmothers, great-grandmothers used to make them all the time. I, I don't know how popular that is today, but nonetheless, they're precious to us. So as we were uh, musing over them, we began to talk about Paul and Acts and how the Lord extended his ministry above where he was able to go in person by laying hands 
on cloths and anointing them with oil and sending them to different people who were dealing with infirmities, needed deliverance, restoration in families, no telling what. Healing comes in many different packages. So uh, as we were discussing this, the Lord began to lay many people on our hearts. I don't have enough handkerchiefs for all of you, but we wanted to do at least three this morning. Um, and along with them, we uh, had a couple of cards. I need to get more cards, too. I only had the two. Uh, but I will let Jeff explain to you what we want to do with these hankies, as my grandma used to call them. We, um, we know that these, these three folks, um, we're not um, saying that the prayers for them so far are not doing any good. What we're saying is that we are using an additional tactic as we pray for these folks. So let me just share with you. One of them is, is Benny, Robert Benjamin, who's been going through, as you all well know, so many medical issues, and he's been such a blessing. You know, he and Glenda help feed 500 children every week, feed a child, and uh, of course his musical ministry and his uh, talents with cuisine and all that. And uh, he's going through so many things. And what we want to do is we're going to put this handkerchief up here on the prayer rail, and as you all feel led, come up and, and pray. And we're going to anoint it, and we're going to give it to him. Another person is, is one of Kathy's childhood friends in Pennsylvania. Her name's Patty, and you all don't know Patty, but she's going through such, um, such a time physically, and she's been on Kathy's heart for, since they were teenagers. So we've got a handkerchief for Patty. The third one is for Brother Steve. Brother Steve's going through some physical ailments, as you know, but also... Brother Steve has the joy of the Lord. And I know that lately, brother, the devil's tried to take that joy from you. And I have a word to you from God. And he says that he's going to give you his joy unspeakable, that the enemy will not take it from you. And as we pray for these handkerchiefs and give them to you, that God's going to minister to you. And that joy is going to increase. And the joy of the Lord will be your strength. And... Um, there's some cards up here. If you all would like to sign the card, we're going to send some cards also. So that being said, we want to um, put these up on the prayer rail. I don't even know which is which now. This is, this is Steve's, right? Oh, that's an example. Okay. Well, anyway, come up and pray for these um, hankies and sign these cards if you would, please. We'll put them up on the prayer rail. Thank you. And then we'll anoint it with oil. Oh, yeah, I forgot the most important thing. I want to read a scripture real quick. I'm sorry. Um, let me read this real quick so you all know where it's coming from in the Bible. Acts 19.12. Paul was in Ephesus. He was preaching for a couple of years, and uh, he just uh, prayed with 12 folks to receive the Holy Spirit. And then on verse 12, it says this. So this is from Paul's body. From his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. And uh, as these folks have these hankies, God's going to minister to them. And, and that's what our prayer is. Okay, what I want to do, have you got all the handkerchiefs laid up there? Okay. As many of you as would like to, let's just gather around the altar and we'll pray together over these and just and believe God. You know, the Bible has precedence. God sets precedence. And, you know, it also tells us that he's no respecter of persons. And I believe if he did something through one person or for one person, he's willing to do it or, or through other people. So let's gather around up here and pray over these. Mm. 
Hallelujah. Father, we know that a piece of cloth in itself is a piece of cloth. But Lord, the Bible says the anointing breaks the yoke. The anointing is what sets captives free. The anointing is what causes miracles to take place. And Father, as we do this in obedience to your word and in, in obedience to the, the, uh, the urging that you've placed upon Kathy and Jeff, Father, we ask that the anointing of the Holy Spirit would come upon these claws. And we pray, Lord, that that would truly be an anointing that breaks the yoke, the yoke of, of sickness and pain, the yokeness of depression, the yoke of, of sadness, the yoke of darkness, the yoke of, of, of hopelessness. Lord, all these things that Satan loves to send, all the things that Satan wants to throw at us, and he's so good he has an arsenal. But, Lord, I thank you that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And, Lord, we've worshipped you today. We've declared your glory and your majesty. Lord, we've read your scripture that talks about the majesty of the God and the magnitude of the power of the God that we serve. So today we declare the lordship of Jesus over every infirmity, over every spirit that Satan would try to send to pull us down, to, to discourage us, to do anything. We rebuke spirits of infirmity, spirits of sickness and disease, spirits of, of uh, depression, hopelessness, all these things. We declare the lordship of Jesus over each one. And Father, I thank you that the word says that that name is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. So, Father, we pray for that anointing and that power and that glory to be upon these strips of cloth. And, Father, we pray that when they are delivered to the ones for which they're intended, that the power of God would be released and the presence of God and the Spirit of God would come upon those that receive them. And I pray that it would have the same effect of those that came from the body of Paul where evil spirits had to depart and sickness had to flee and healing took place. So, Father, we ask all that today in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen, amen and Amen. Hallelujah. And anybody that will, sign the card. <laughs>